All right, so welcome back everybody. Today we're gonna to be going over some wintertime protection, especially for those of us that are down here in the south, dealing with these drastic drops in temperatures and winter storms I know a lot of y'all are dealing with. Our plumbing and everything's just not set up for it. I know a lot of y'all watch our channel for the house build and are still watching that series. So there's some do's and don'ts, maybe even some regrets that I have here that hopefully you can apply to your new house or barn and shop build for plumbing protection. So while I know a lot of y'all are dealing with major minus temperatures and craziness a lot of y'all are actually prepared plumbing wise for this down here in florida in the deep south we very rarely see some of the temperatures that we're about to see this week we're going to see multiple days in the 20s and i'm seeing teens on the wind chill here so we need to protect our plumbing pool equipment things like that we typically don't winterize very well for stuff like that because we just don't see it a whole lot so we've got some new plumbing based on our pool pump build here i'm going to tell you what i'm going to do to protect my system through these few days it's going to dip down to where it could damage plumbing and pipes and we have brand new exposed pipes like this that we need to get insulated plus I have some pipe protection that y'all recommended last year that I have never even seen down here or ran before uh, to protect our critical pipes just outside the house where our water filtration system and all is you may want to stay tuned for that right there that can really help you out now what we're ultimately going to be doing with our pool equipment is building an enclosure over here for extra protection from the Sun and cold we'll cover that in the future and I'm gonna apologize there is gnat swarming everywhere right here sometimes there is good things that come with a cold i cannot wait to get these multiple deep freezes that we're about to get multiple days of it to kill off all these aggravating gnats and mosquitoes that we tend to grow down here in the south so for starters go to your local hardware store and get you some pipe insulation it's just foam insulation it'll usually last out in the sun quite a few years before it deteriorates so this isn't permanent there's all different types of wraps and stuff that you can do but i can pick these up for like three dollars at my local store and uh, it's a good way to insulate your pipes there's also different types of spigots that you can put on. If you're in an area that freezes a lot, they have frost-proof spigots that'll actually open and close themselves and dump if it gets too cold. You can drip your faucets like we do, or I'm gonna show you a little bit later out by the building. I put in special just above ground tees to where I can actually drain the system down on my non-critical plumbing. So when it comes to this pipe insulation, you can get it to where it'll seal back on itself. I'm having a hard time finding that. Or this right here that you can just split open with your fingers. And the reason you want to tear the slit open is on already installed plumbing. If you're putting brand new plumbing in, you don't even have to tear this in. You can slide it on and then glue your fittings on. Now keep in mind, all this that I'm showing you is for southern states. We have no frost line here. We're not worried about protecting beneath the ground. It just does not happen down here in Florida. I've never seen the ground actually completely freeze. All right, this stuff cuts really nice and easy with a razor knife. All right, so when it comes to our pool equipment, a lot of you are gonna winterize, especially if you're up north, where you're gonna completely drain the pool, drain your equipment, and just put it up for winter, maybe cover your pool over. Well, because we see such few freezing temperature days down here in the south, I leave mine running year round. Actually, our dogs still enjoy swimming in it, even this time of year, so we just leave it going. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna come in here to my manual timer. By the way, if you're not familiar with these, you can pull out and adjust this clock anywhere you want it to go. But these are on and off switches. So basically, right before we go to bed on a cold night, I'll just rotate the off switch around past this switch. I can flip this on and this would technically run for 24 hours. So long story short, because our pool water is 50 some odd degrees right now, I expect it to dip in the 40s with this freeze that we're gonna have, but it's not actually gonna get cold enough. That's a huge amount of water to try to get below freezing. We're just not gonna see ice or anything here in the pool itself. We would have to have an extended freeze. So just by running the pump a few hours at night when we're the below freezing temperatures it'll pull the water out of the pool run it through all the equipment and that allows all of this plastic equipment that houses water to not freeze up and potentially split and bust so while this does use a little extra electricity doing that we're just going to run the equipment the few below freezing nights that we're going to get here otherwise if you're in an area where you're going to see a bunch of freezing nights i think it'll make a lot more sense to completely drain your equipment and put it up for winter and one area I messed up, we're gonna talk about in just a minute, I did not put a cutoff valve yet to our outside spigots. That's something I really need to do. So I'll just leave these dripping 
kind of like that on the cold nights because these pipes are underground here and because we have no frost line, the water is technically getting warmed up by the ground temperature before it ever makes it out of the spigot itself. And as long as you keep a sufficient flow, we'll have 60 to 70 degree water coming up and out of these spigots right here. And it does not have time to freeze once it gets above ground right here. So the other thing I like to do, I've learned my lesson over the years. I like to completely disconnect hoses because there is water all in these, they will freeze up. And here's where I've also messed up. A lot of times you'll just throw your little spray wand or nozzle on the ground. You need to press and open this and watch the water that'll run out the end right there. So it just flowed out really good. Now we've just removed all of the water out of here because we allowed air to enter. This won't freeze and bust. I've had that happen many times. I've also learned my lesson recently with things like ice makers. Because we have an ice maker outside, when we start getting below freezing, the ice maker itself will malfunction. The cubes will freeze up in there because it's not actually meant to work below freezing. And then things like our outdoor sink, I'll run a small space heater underneath where the plumbing is to protect that overnight. All right, so this is something new I am trying this year and I need to explain what the craziness is that I just done. This is called heat tape right here or a heat strip. So you can actually wrap these around critical pipes, plug them in and these sense when it gets below freezing and they turn themselves on and all of this heats up. You can get them in different lengths, different powers, all that kind of stuff and that's worth discussing. So I'll put a link in the description, but I got mine from a company called Vivor. And if you read right here on it, you can see if it'll focus 24 foot, it's five watts a foot. Although as we just seen, that varies a little. You can get them less powerful than this, more powerful, longer, shorter. The reason I chose this particular power range right here is it should provide plenty of heat for my pipes. And I'm trying to stay on the mid to lower end. I probably should have went less because we're converting the house to solar. And if a few of these are gonna pull several hundred to a thousand watts throughout a night, that's a big demand on my solar batteries. So why did I just pull these out of the freezer? You see this right here? This actually reads temperature. And if we're not below freezing, these do not activate. So as these warm up, this should cut off. So I had to stick them in the freezer to get below freezing so I could plug these in, make sure they pull power. Because we're gonna be ripping off pipe insulation, installing these and putting insulation back, it's a little bit of an involved process to install these. And the last thing I wanna do is go install one only to find out it's not working correctly. So as these warm up, I should be able to plug them back in and you'll see that they won't pull power because it automatically cuts off and on here. So that's a nice feature that these are automatic and sense the temperature and you don't have to remember to go outside and plug these in. All right, so here's our outdoor plumbing setup going into the house. A line comes underground from the well, which we also need to protect. Comes to the outside to some whole house water filters that we have over to an on-demand water heater and then ultimately goes into the house itself. And I know a lot of y'all are probably thinking, why would you even have all this outside? This is just very common in the way we do it in the South, all the way from Florida to Texas, up into the Carolinas, a lot of people have stuff outside. There's benefits to having things that can leak outside. There's benefits to water heaters outside. I prefer it and I don't mind the few days a year that we have to do a little bit of freeze protection. Again, if I was up north, all of this stuff would be inside and I would just take the leaking risk and other problems with it. We'd put it in a pantry or a utility, for example. And just FYI, we are planning on building a well house this year, so we'll have protection out there. And I'm really thinking about building maybe a cover to go over some of this stuff. But between what we're gonna do today, and I usually run a heat lamp out here whenever we get dip into the 20s, I have yet to have a single issue with any of this busting. So because we have power out here, long story short, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna remove any of this insulation and replace if necessary, and then unwind this heat strip right here, heat tape, and just attach it straight to the pipe, tape it on, you can wire clamp it on, and then put your insulation back. So this provides a heat strip all along your pipe 
adding just a little bit of warmth to the pipe and the water that's supposedly flowing through it or sitting in it, and uh, it'll keep it above freezing. I'd imagine if you're in an extremely cold area, you could twist this all around the pipe itself. I think I'm just gonna lay one strip flat on these small pipes right here, and that should provide just enough warmth to keep everything above freezing. On super cold nights too, we also drip our faucets inside, so we constantly have that warmer groundwater coming through these pipes as well. All right, that was relatively straightforward. What I did is start with my cord here that we can plug into an outdoor box since it's all automatic. And I ran the uh, heat tape, started going underneath all of the insulation here, fed it all the way around, back up over and underneath the water heater, back down this pipe to the ground, back up here, and then I had some excess. So I decided to just loop it around the tops of my water filters. That should just provide a little extra heat there, but all of the heat strip tapes actually underneath the insulation everywhere else. So this should give me really good protection. Now I know what you're probably thinking, what about your water filters? Because they keep water in them and we have a descale filter down here just for scale buildup since we have well water. Well, all I'll do is just take one of these large, you know, chicken coop lights right here 250 watts, honestly, incandescent light bulbs, smaller heat lamps, they work really well for doing this. Just about every house you drive by in the south at nighttime when we're getting freezing temperatures, you'll see these little red lights running everywhere. So I just drive a piece of rebar in, I'll put this right here for this general area, plug it in, and uh, zip tie it on. I'm not gonna do this until right before the freeze because we're supposed to get rain tomorrow. You would be amazed at how big of an area a heat lamp like this will cover. It will keep the temperature here well above freezing. You can come out and touch stuff at night and while it's not hot and melting, you're, you're just well above freezing. So I'll aim one of these toward these three filters and this area stays protected. All right, those of you that are building a new house, I mentioned where I messed up and shame on me for not thinking about this. So our main feed comes from our well over there, underground, and then it tees off to go to the outdoor spigots over there into the pool, tees off here and goes around the house to some more plumbing that we have as an outdoor spigots. And I did not put in a cutoff valve going either direction. I do have one right here at the house. I should have put two cutoff valves in going either direction so when we get deep freezes like this, we can leave water just going to the house and uh, well, we could drain those. You could put a T and a drain down there. I'm gonna show you where I've done this on other sides of the property. So if you're building a new house and gonna have outdoor plumbing and spigots, I would suggest going ahead, actually probably the best thing to do, run one line from the well to the house, put cutoff valves over there like I have, and then run a completely separate line to all your outdoor spigots. So you can see I've already technically kind of done that here. I should have just ran a third line. So coming out of the uh, tank itself, there's a main cutoff valve. We wanna kill all of the plumbing. There is this cutoff valve that goes to the shop, the barn, and I have outdoor faucets everywhere. So the good news is I did think ahead far enough to put a cutoff. And right down here, I have a T with a threaded insert and a drain. So I can kill the water to all of this stuff out here. I don't have to really worry about protecting it. Take this plug out, go open up all those spigots so they'll suck air in. And because this is uphill every direction, all the water will flow down here and flow out on the ground. And I can leave this closed through these cold spells. And we'll just leave this open going to the house. So always put as many cutoff valves in as you can think. And for sure, just try to run the house on its own independent line. That way when you go through these spells, well, you're only worried about the house, everything else is drained and you don't have to go through all these problems. Now, yes, I know a lot of y'all up north are looking at some of this stuff going, this is not how we do it up there. Honestly, we don't really know how you do it up there. Every new construction home around here is built like this. Exposed wells, outdoor faucets everywhere. We just don't really deal with this enough that I guess the extra protection has made it down here into our build standards. So uh, I would be very curious what all y'all do run up there. I know y'all have frost lines and other stuff to worry with. We don't have none of that here, have never experienced that here. So there's some things that y'all do that would just be extra cost and time and not necessary here. 
All right, so when it comes to outdoor wells, there's two areas that you have to pay attention to. One area very specific that has a horrible tendency of freezing up. Now this will all be taken care of once we build us a well house out here. And I actually already have an extra power wire ran out here from the shop so we can run heat lamps inside and everything else once uh, we get this fully enclosed, only if necessary. So excuse this uh, heat lamp, it actually went through a tornado <laughs> and I'm still using it. So we'll actually just clamp that on here. This is one area that you really have to watch. All this metal pipe I have found in the past, metal will freeze and split quicker than PVC will, believe it or not. It's just because it gets so cold. So I'll aim a heat lamp toward this area. That usually takes care of it. I'll clamp another one down here and point it toward my pipes going out. A lot of people, and I do this in the past, will wrap a tarpaulin around this to kind of protect it, but it looks so bad. It catches the wind so bad. I don't think I'm gonna worry with that this year. So this is the area to watch. Pressure switch, you can see mine, water comes through here. It's reading pressure out of the tank. Pressure goes up this pipe and tells this switch when to flip off and on. This area is really prone to freezing. Some of y'all have pressure switches that are mounted elsewhere and it has a plastic tube that runs over to this. Those are notorious for freezing. Wrap your plastic tubes up. I usually take an old rag and just uh, tape around it and make sure you have a heat lamp pointed in that direction. Let me show you how to turn these heat lamps off and on. Again, I'm not gonna hook them up just yet because we got rain coming tomorrow, but one heat lamp here, one there, and I put it on an automatic switch so I don't have to worry with it. All right, so these switches, which I get off of Amazon, I'll put a link down in there, are lifesavers for turning on Christmas lights, heat lamps, whatever it may be. These are your dust to dawn switches. So it has multiple switches right here. You can put it on a 12 hour timer, 24 hour, four hour, six. It's got all kinds of stuff here. As well as you can put it on, it's got a photo cell sensor in it. So whenever it goes dark, I have a stench cord plugged into both of those heat lamps. It kicks them on automatically. That way it's foolproof in case I forget to go out there and do it. I don't want my pipes frozen and or busted during the night. And then when the sun comes up in the morning, typically we go above freezing here. It's got to be extremely cold and very unusual to stay below freezing here when the sun's out. This will cut itself off and you're good to go. Now, if you're dealing with freezing temperatures all day long where you live, you know, I know some of y'all in Texas are dealing with that right now. Just turn this to always on, allow heat lamps and things to run 24 seven. Ultimately covering everything up, getting it out of the elements is our ultimate goal here and where we wanna go. I'm mainly speaking to everybody in the South here where we're a bit unprepared for when cold snaps like this come. All right, new homeowners and everybody else that I'm speaking to, there is other things that you need to be prepared for. Should you live in an area like, let's just say Texas, for example, this is now y'all's like second record cold snap. Y'all are starting to experience enough of these every few years. Y'all probably should start preparing more like, well, Northerners do. Things people may not think of. Do you have water-filled tractor tires? You probably need to go convert those over to something that will not freeze your vehicles, what about all your coolant tanks for your windshield wiper fluids? Well, those will split and bust. I've had it happen here. We always start running zero degree washer fluid, usually around September, October is the earliest we can find it here in the South. Even my tractor over there has a washer fluid reservoir. Don't forget about those types of things. They will freeze and they will bust on you. So make sure you've got all that converted over. Are you like me? I have a trash pump out here. This is my little firefighting rig. And if you leave water in the pump itself, you'll split and bust the casing of that pump. That's a critical piece of equipment for me. I just had it out yesterday for a fire that was burning beside us. So make sure you drain water out of stuff like that. All right, I told y'all, we're gonna drain all the plumbing out here because it's not critical, but there's still things like water filters right here that will hold water. And I need to unscrew this, dump it out, or this will split as well. I also go ahead and disconnect all hoses. Outside faucets like this has water all the way up to the cutoff valve. This will split and bust, but once I disconnect the hose that's feeding it, you open this up, air will suck in, the water runs out, and you don't wind up splitting and busting things like this. I know some of this is common sense to a lot of y'all, but I'm talking to people that are new to homes, new to buildings, new to property, not thinking about this stuff. I have damaged enough stuff over the years that, well, you learn by your mistakes, correct? While we're not getting cold enough here, I'm gonna put a heat lamp in for our chickens. We are gonna stick extra straw and stuff up in the boxes if they wanna get up there and warm up. Heat lamps is controversial for chickens. Now, if y'all were up there dealing with minus temperatures and all, for sure, take care of your animals. We're not getting that cold here. Boats, y'all, make sure you tilt your motors down 
because water will remain in the lower foot of a boat. And I have heard many times of people splitting lower units on boats. That's something else a lot of people don't think of. This particular boat does not hold water in the lower unit, but we have one inside the shop that can, but it does not get below freezing in the shop. Speaking of animals, we got a heating blanket out in Ruger's kennel and a bed. Actually, he loves the cold weather. He usually kicks the heating blanket out of his uh, doghouse because, well, he gets excited about the cold and he cannot stand getting warm. Now, yes, if we were gonna see some of these negative crazy temperatures y'all were seeing, well, the dog would just come inside. We're gonna take care of our animals, but labs love cold. He literally will go swimming again this afternoon and tomorrow and probably the day that we literally have teens on the wind chill, I guarantee you he'll be in the pool swimming. Something else is often forgotten about. If you have rain gauges out here like I do, I don't need it because I got a weather station, but I just keep rain gauges as well. Dump those, these will split and bust on you. Your animal's water, your chicken water, I know ours is gonna freeze up, but being we're only gonna be dealing with this a couple of days, we're gonna come out, freshen up the water every day, and I'm usually up by daylight doing that anyways. Lastly, delicate plants like those that we have down here in the south, citruses, we have boxes full of what's called frost blankets that will drape over this. We use clothes pins to actually pinch and hold them to stuff like this so they don't blow off. You can wrap them around and clothes pin the cloth back on itself, but we do not put frost blankets out until after the last rain. Again, it's gonna rain tomorrow. A frost blanket will get damp. It'll hold that moisture. And then when it freezes immediately after that, you have literally ice laying on the plant and it will kill them even through the frost blankets. To all of my people that's watching and you're into solar, thinking about getting into solar or already into it, but you're not thinking about your batteries. Lithium batteries, most are not designed to be recharged, especially rapid recharge, below freezing, below 32 degrees protect your investment, your battery. So my shop over there, what I'll do is just disconnect the solar from my off-grid shop there so the battery doesn't charge until after daylight and the temperature's up. Or I could run a small space heater in there around my equipment. Same thing over here with my large on the wall system. These batteries, well, we're probably not gonna get below freezing in the shop, although it could happen. We're just gonna have to watch these temperatures. I'll just disconnect solar, make sure these do not charge. What I am gonna continue to run the shop on and I'm still testing is my new EcoFlow unit. And one thing I forgot to mention in my review, this actually has a heated battery in it. This can operate down to minus four degrees. So it senses whenever it gets below freezing, it'll use some of its power, heat the battery itself up to protect it and keep it above freezing, and it can charge and work as normal. So I've already got the shop running on this right now, and I'm just gonna continue to run this through the cold spell. I know I'm vomiting a lot of information on y'all, but well, these things are interesting to me, and hopefully to you as well. Now that we're still on solar subject, y'all keep in mind when you see extreme temperatures like this, solar panels themselves will actually do a spike, an increase in voltage on very cold days like this. I've witnessed it many times with my own system. Typically you take a factor of 1.25, a cold factor as they call it, for the output of your panel, that it could potentially go over its rated capacity by 0.25. So you use that number whenever you're building out your system to know that on extremely cold days when you get weird cloud effect patterns and things like that, your panel that's say rated for 100 watts could potentially do up to 125 watts. And I can tell you from experience, this 2400 watt array, I have seen at times do 26, 2800 or more watts. Your voltage, your wattage, which all correlates with each other, will spike up. This is very important too because you could potentially go over voltage for your expensive solar equipment and damage it through cold spells like this. Keep that in mind. A lot of y'all watch the channel for solar. Always underrate your system. Most people say over panel, over watt. Just make for sure your amperage and voltage is nice and safe. And in the event of really cold spells or odd cloud cover, know that you can go over rated capacity. You need to be prepared for that. I hope you've made it this far in the video. Something else that is critical that we need to talk about, this is the preparedness in me, and you need to be this way. Anytime I do a plumbing project, electrical project, anything on the property, and I'm going by and plumbing pipe and little fittings and glue and everything else, always buy extra, keep you some totes or some buckets full of that stuff. Think about this, a lot of y'all are about to experience record cold. You didn't do some of these preparations, you're already in it right now. You're gonna come out the other side of this with busted plumbing, stuff spraying everywhere, killing the water to your house, no plumbing, 
no sanitary good conditions, can't take showers. And what are you gonna do? You're gonna rush to your local Lowe's, Home Depot, and Ace, along with everybody else who was not prepared. And guess what? The glue's gonna be sold out. All the fittings, the pipe, everything you need to make your repairs. Good luck calling the plumber. He's getting so many calls, he doesn't have time to come out to you as well. And when he does, it's gonna be so expensive. This is what I always do right here in order to be prepared. Plumbing, well, water. It's key to so much of our convenient lifestyle. I always am prepared for it. One of the most often overlooked things, glue. I have multiple cans of sealed PVC glue in here along with thread, compound, and everything else. When you open up a can of PVC glue, it usually will only last a couple weeks before air has entered the can, it hardens up, and it is no good. Keep multiple spare cans of all-purpose PVC glue for CPVC, regular PVC, and all the different types of plumbing you may have in the house. Keep you a bunch of these on hand. All right, here we are up in my shop attic. Excuse the mess, but look. I keep spare spigots. Those are bad about splitting and busting. Spare check valves. And in here is hundreds upon hundreds of drain waste fittings. Spare one inch, which is all my plumbing around the property. I have everything you can think of to repair a spigot, put a T in, a new drain, anything that I want. This is all plumbing stuff. CPVC for our hot water side. Always grab you a few extra over the years. It only costs you a few dollars at a time. And next thing you know, you have got you a heck of a spare assortment here to bail you out of any emergency for just, well, a few hundred dollars for all kinds of spare parts. And let me tell you something, this stuff does nothing but go up, <laughs> so you're better off buying it now than a few years down the road. And it's not like this really goes bad. I keep spare electrical, all kinds of stuff. I think it goes without saying, did you prepare and get plenty of fuel for your generator? Do you have solar or all those batteries charged up? You knew that storm was coming. The news has been talking about it for weeks. Did you get your large propane tank topped off? These are all things that you really should be prepared for for any types of storms or potential power outages. Sadly, what typically happens for a lot of y'all, thank goodness we live in an area that doesn't do rolling blackouts. Tennessee and a lot of those places, California, everywhere else, Texas, I do believe, it blew my mind the last time we had a major winter storm like this and how many of y'all got your power cut off on purpose because of our aging and failing power grids. And everybody's trying to use power through these storms to run heaters and save themselves, literally save themselves. People, skip the next iPhone, the next tablet, maybe even the next vacation. I don't care what you get. Get you a generator, get you some solar, something. The world's just getting crazier. These storms are getting, well, out of hand. There's too many potential risks out there for you to not have some sort of backup power, plumbing, water, all these things that really make life much more convenient and safe for you and your family. Start thinking about that at least for the next storm or next year.